computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Multiple people can share. So go for it if you want to pick it up yeah. now, mate. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Have you got the Mount Pleasant logo? Yep. Yep. Perfect. But can, you make it, can, you, can you make it so I can't see you, Garrick? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll pay extra. <laughs> <laughs> you guys stop teaming up. There you go. How's that? I emailed, Rob, I emailed Rob earlier and we discussed yeah. what ammo we should hit you with. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've got a whole schedule, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Was that um, you that supplied that photo to Rob? <laughs> <laughs> it's, only, it's only nine o'clock. It's not even nine o'clock. We've already got one in. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, Garrick, can you just make Adrian, pin Adrian as the primo dude again, so that we have him constantly. How, how do I do that, mate? I think it, just, I think it, with me, it just happens. Yeah, let's just, let's throw it to the, <laughs> throw it to the guys. He's got to keep talking. He goes top <laughs> of the pops if he keeps talking. <laughs> I think I saw on the Patricia. Participants there. We've got Kelvin Tan there. Yeah, Kelvin's here. I think it's different. Uh, uh, Kelvin, I think it might be a different Kelvin from who you know. Hachu. Yeah, okay. from Hachu, yeah. Okay. I, I was speaking to him the other the other day and I let him know that we're... Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, cool. Two minutes to run. There you go. Hey, Lou, how are you going? Oh, good to see you, mate. Hey, Rob, Rob, I just found Alex. He's unaware yeah, of you. Yeah, I'm texting you. Don't worry. We'll clean it up afterwards. It's all right. All right. Uh, Adrian, um, Adrian's our general manager and winemaker. I uh, just wanted to introduce you to Lou. So Lou uh, with Rob are the owners of Wine Exchange up in Singapore. Oh, nice to meet you. Hey, pleasure. How are you doing? Good, mate. How are you? All right. I'll, I'll apologise up front. At least 15 times during the next 20 minutes, Robert will refer to Mount Pleasant as McWilliams. No, right. no, I've got it right. There's a, there's a sticky tape. No, right? no. You'll fuck <laughs> it. You, you <laughs> then every time he mentions it, he's going to buy a pallet, Lou. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> All right. Oh, oh, oh shit. Okay. No pressure. No pressure. What's that? three times. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh god i'm gonna right. wire up his testicles to a button or something every time he goes <laughs> no but to be fair i'm sure it's not just me that makes that balls up no yeah there we go no it's not <laughs> no it's not it's not you <laughs> it's not just you <laughs> Okay, I hope everybody who's on the call has chilled the first two wines. I didn't put a little reminder in there to actually do that tonight. So um, here's hoping. Although uh, I always feel looking at, at Semyon uh, and, and Chardonnay as well, at just cool is uh, the best way to really drill down into the wines. I'm not sure how Adrian feels. Uh, Adrian, uh, Garrick uh, will know because he's, he's been visited us a few times over the years in Singapore, but... Uh, the tendency here is to chill anything white down to sort of polar ice slushy condition, which yep. tends to shut everything down. Uh, but I guess it's better that than to, than to warm. Um, as I got older, I've, I've tended to prefer to decant Semillon and Chardonnay, but you've got to drink it quick because the ambient temperature will, will win the race at the end of the day. But guys, if you wouldn't mind lining up jars number one and two, because I want to, I want to check those out uh, side by side, and then we'll ask Adrian to to take a wonder through the presentation first up. I'm really excited to have you here, Adrian. Thank you, and Gary, who heads up uh, exports for Mount Pleasant. Um, I, I looked at my sticky tape there, Lou, just so as you know, I, I got the name right. It's probably the last time. Um, Adrian, uh, of course, after 20 years of Mount Pleasant, is a specialist in, in Hunter Valley, but um, has uh, uh, worked and made wine all around the world. Um, he's fifth in line, if I have my, my, my research correct, Adrian is fifth in line after the famous Maurice O'Shea, after whom uh, we, uh, we're tasting uh, jar number six tonight, the Maurice O'Shea 2014. 
which is uh, has the exceptional uh, uh, note of being rated 99 points from James Halliday. Um, one small error in the email that I sent at 6.30, the Marie Sachet is 199, not 99. Uh, I was wearing the wrong glasses at the time. So please don't. One, Rob. Yeah, yeah, please don't submerge me with orders at 90. I'll never hear the end of it from Lou. So uh, with that very raggedy introduction, uh, over to you, Adrian. Oh, is it uh, Garrick? You're going to crack it up? I'll, I'll do a real, <laughs> real, real quick intro and then we'll oh, okay. throw across to Adrian. But hey, good rehearsal. Rob and, <laughs> Rob and Lou, thanks for, uh, thanks for having us here. And for everyone in Singapore, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, as, as Rob mentioned, you know, Mount Pleasant is one of the premium wine estates in the, uh, certainly in the Hunter Valley, but certainly in Australia as well. We are known as the, the birthplace of Australian wine. Um, for those of you that uh, may have heard of Maurice O'Shea, he's considered the, the grandfather of the Australian wine industry. Um, many people have heard of, of Max Schubert from Penfold's fame. Max actually learned a lot of his trade from Maurice, uh, Maurice O'Shea. So Maurice founded and uh, bought what was a 40-year-old block um, in the 1921 and set up Mount Pleasant. So we're going to take you through just a little presentation here. We don't want to bore you too much. We'll move through fairly quickly. Then we'll throw to Adrian to talk through the wines with you. But like always with, with these things, we want this to be interactive. We want everyone to enjoy the wines. So if you have questions, please just, just call through and uh, we'd love to take you through the wines. So moving on. So here's a little snapshot here of uh, up from our old hill looking down into the Mount Pleasant winery. So you can see, you know, we are a family business, but we're still a fairly small boutique um, winery. Everything we make comes off our property and we'll talk through those different vineyards and Adrian will certainly talk through those. But as I mentioned, we're established by Maurice O'Shea, um, who is the grandfather of, of the Australian wine industry. Um, in 1932, McWilliams bought its first share in Mount Pleasant and really kept Maurice O'Shea on as its, as its first winemaker until his death in 1956. We fast forward through to 2021, we're celebrating our 100th year and really, really happy to have Adrian on board with us. Adrian is the fifth winemaker in the 100 year history at Mount Pleasant. So quite a special thing, you know, these winemakers come through as, as custodians um, and, you know, really happy to have Adrian on and, and to talk through the wines. Little snapshot here of, of Morris. Um, so, you know, the irony is ev everything that Morris did here was done by a gas lamp, you know, without electricity. The irony being, unfortunately, at his, his death in 1956 was the first time we had electricity at the winery. But it's, I think it talks, it speaks volumes to the wines that Morris O'Shea made back in, in the 50s and 40s. These wines, if you can still find them today, you know, the 1945s, 46, they're worth about seven, eight thousand dollars a bottle. The point is they're drinking really well. And this was all done before electricity. So it talks to the, the vineyards, but it also talks to the styles and the blends that Morris O'Shea made. Coming on here, so a little bit of background. So like Morris's uh, name suggests, he's actually half French and half Irish, um, but learned all his winemaking skills in France's Mont Montpellier uh, University, where he went in his early 20s, came back with all those French wine techniques and started Mount Pleasant, as I said, in 1921. So we'll touch on a little bit more of Morris. We'll touch on a bit more of the vineyards and the uniqueness of the wines as we hand over to, to Adrian. Uh, we are considered one of the most awarded wineries in Australia. In 2017, we're named Winery of the Year by James Halliday in his book and had, you know, seven of our Shirazes uh, over 97 points and 99 points was the 2014 Shiraz, which we're going to taste today. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Adrian, as I mentioned, as the fifth winemaker for, for Mount Pleasant. Do you want me to just read all the great things I've done now, Garrick? Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. That helps. <laughs> just, you might have to just get your head yeah. to go a bit smaller because it's growing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll look at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, it's been a real sort of amazing, I suppose, and, and different 18 months 
um, going through the administration and coming out the other side. And we're really excited about Mount, where Mount Pleasant is now and, and especially excited about where it's going to be in the future. We've got a great history, as sort of Garrick touched on, about Morris O'Shea, um, you know, the wines he made in the times that he did it is unreal. And they're probably, you know, Mount Pleasant's got, you know, the greatest history of being able to age table wines in Australia. He was the first person to do it. Um, and, you know, Garrick spoke about Max Schubert. Uh, Max Schubert actually said that he was humbled to be in the presence of an O'Shea wine, um, such was his esteem at the time. Um, and, and we're very fortunate to have the vineyards that we have, uh, vineyards dating back to 1880, um, when Morris bought the place in 1921, he planted the old paddock, um, and he also planted a block of Pinot Noir, which was cuttings from the Busby collection, which was stored at the Botanical Gardens in Sydney. And, and from that vineyard, um, they produced the MV6 clone, which has now propagated virtually all of Australia's MV6 clone Pinot Noir. So it's a great site those both those blocks are now 100 years old so to have a 100 year old pinot block in australia it's the oldest commercial vineyard of pinot in australia so it's a really big thing that we get the opportunity to look at those uh, blocks and, and be able to make those wines and share them with you um, it's, a, it's a really cool thing and that's one of those wines we'll be tasting tonight adrian is that shiraz pinot uh blend. yeah yeah it's a morris yeah morris is the I'll, I'll touch on it then morris is the first person to really start blending varieties and, and naming wines by style rather than variety um and, and the mount henry was one of those but we'll touch on that um derek's got a lovely map there of where the hunter valley is so a couple of hours north of sydney um and the, and the weather usually dictates how we make our wines we're very much a medium bodied style of wine um you know lower lower alcohols um we don't have the huge fruit weight and the big oak bombs that we see across Australia. We're very much medium bodied, which lends itself to beautiful aging potential. Um, and as I spoke about earlier, the wines that Morris O'Shea made are still singing today. Um, and um, if you ever get the chance to try an O'Shea in, in the wine industry in Australia, we talk, everyone talks about, um, you know, have you ever tried an O'Shea wine? Um, Cause that's the pinnacle. That's, to be able to taste one of those wines. I've only ever tried five or six in my life and I, I work here. So to be able to find one, um, to be able to taste one is a pretty surreal experience. Um, if you ever get that opportunity, you know, savour it. But, uh, they don't come along very often. Um, PowerPoints, I suppose. Garrick's got the range there. So love Dale and O'Shea, our, our um, icon wines. The O'Shea is the blend of the, the best of the best, the best barrels that we could possibly do, which truly represents um, the vineyards and the region um, and, and, and what the climate was at the time. We want our wines to express um, <clears throat> what it was like that year and, and to really show um, where they're from. And you know, the, the O'Shea for us is the epitome of what we can do in the Hunter Valley, um, the, sort of at our top end. Uh, heritage wines, so our two vineyards, our two main red vineyards of our three that we own. Um, one is Rose Hill, which is um, has a beautiful northeasterly facing aspect, um, which lends itself to lighter, more floral, red fruited, lighter wines. Um, and then the estate where the winery is based, the old paddock and old hill vineyards, which are a bit denser, a bit darker, a bit more rugged, a bit more tannin. So they're very contrasting um, and made in the same house. Um, made similarly, but we, we do modify the winemaking slightly in terms of fermentation techniques to really bring out the best of those vineyards. And that's what it's all about, you know showcasing those vineyards and making sure that those differences in their vineyards are shown. Um, there was a time a fair while ago, 20 years ago, that, you know, all the wines were made the same and smashed with oak. And we've definitely um, reined that right back in to make sure that what you're tasting is um, from a certain place. And that's what's most important. You want to be able to taste a wine, be educated about that wine and, and be able to remember that wine in the future. Uh, the two mountain wines there. Um, sort of touched on, Morris O'Shea made wines of style rather than wines of variety. So we call these wines Mountain A, Mountain D, and Mountain C. The Mountain A is just a medium body dry red. Um, Mountain C, the light body dry red, and Mountain D, full body dry red. And they were just examples of the, the vintages that he um, faced in the really hot um, vintages. He would make a, a full body dry red because that's what the vintage gave him um, in the cooler, Lighter years, he'd make a mountain sea, a light body dry red. And in those classical perfect years, he'd make the mountain A, the medium body dry red, which is you know, classically Hunter Valley. Um, 
and then our family range, the Phillip, which is a blend of all our vineyards to best represent what we think the Hunter Valley shows. Um, we want it to be drinkable, um, the complexity um, and the ability to age. And same with the Semion, the Elizabeth Semion. It's been around for, oh, it must be 30 years now. And, you know, from 2014, which I think we're, what we're trying tonight, was the first time Elizabeth's exclusively made off the Lovedale Vineyard, always prior to that um, vintage. There was other bits and pieces of Semion that we'd buy from all around the traps um, to, to fill that volume. And now, um, and proudly, Elizabeth's exclusively off, off the Lovedale Vineyard because it's a very, very unique vineyard in terms of what it provides and in terms of the ability to age. So that's a really cool thing that we've got that now. Oh, oh so yeah, so love sort of loved our vineyard. Um, you want to start trying the wines? Yeah, it is. We do that. Yeah. yeah, so I mean the two wines, the two whites that you've got there, um, the 14 Elizabeth, I think, and the 18, 1946 vines, loved our semion. So have a taste of those and I'll try and explain what makes those wines like they are. Um, the Elizabeth Semion, the Lovedales on this sandy site, very flat. O'Shea was told not to plant there. He purchased the land in 1939. The government took it over in 1940 to use as an airstrip um, during the war. It was handed back the vineyard in 1945 and, and planted again in 1946. And it wasn't until 1950, some 11 years later, um, that he got his first crop, which, which is, Fairly, fairly significant in terms of it, if anyone ever said you have got a return on investment in 11 years' time, you just tell them. Well, mate, no on that point, I, I don't know how Mount Pleasant has ever got an ROI on their sims because we're actually looking at current vintage releases here. I mean, the, the notion of holding these wines so long before they come to market, I mean, it's sensational for consumers. We're looking at, a, if our math's right, a seven year old semi on here for $38, uh, the, the Elizabeth, it's just extraordinary value. And one of the biggest tragedies for me over the years that I've been drinking semi on is, and especially Hunter, is it's, it needs that time to really show what it's all about. I've, I've become obsessed with Lovedale. I think the Lovedale and the Tyrrells are the two for me that represent the finest uh, semi on expressions out of Hunter. And uh, I get all greedy and drink them two years after release and think like, where's the love because all all i'm getting is just, you know a, a good wine but not that amazing luscious generosity that uh we taste in particularly in lovedale over the years it's an extraordinary and a, a really specific uh point of value that mount pleasant has that almost no other wineries uh who make semion do so it's exceptionally good yeah we asked it we are now the only winery that holds back its wines deliberately um lovedale elizabeth are always a five-year release um, and we've kept that tradition going, much to yeah. the disappointment of our accountants and <laughs> people, that want to, people that want to pay the bills because, yeah. you know, they're, they're, but, you know, it needs that time. You think now, originally in the 90s and 2000s, they were under cork, they aged a lot faster. Now under screw cap with the technologies that we've got, you know, seven years is probably optimum now, yeah. whereas we used to think it was five years. So um, the ability to try a 2014 and have it look so fresh and young uh, is really a testament. Yeah, it's really a testament to the vineyard and, and, and what it produces. Um, you touched on Tyrrells before, but, you know, Lovedale has always been a lighter, more aromatic, more floral expression yes. of Hunter Valley Semion. Yes. Whereas Tyrrells is a bit richer, full-bodied, yeah. um, more palate weight. So they're, they're very, very different styles. And, and you'll often find that people either love Tyrrells and dislike Lovedale yeah. or vice versa. We it's have, a, we it's have a bit like Sydney, hearts. Melbourne. People, people, yeah. people pick a team and really stick with it. Uh, yeah, I, it's people, yeah, people just swear on Lovedale. Um, yeah. And Elizabeth is great because it comes off some younger vines and some older vines, but so it has the complexity of different blocks. Um, so it, it truly is an amazing wine. And the, the 1946 vines, Lovedale, um, so that comes exclusively off the old vines. And it, it's a little sort of section at, at the back um there's a little bit of a ridge and and we just picked that little bit separately because it lends itself to drinking a little bit younger it's a little bit richer a little bit riper and probably oh. more towards that material yeah. style um so at and, what and at what time frame i guess every vintage is different but the thing that really grabs me by the gonads with these with these two wines is they hit a certain critical uh number of years and suddenly get this wonderful sort of fat silky 
a beautiful pallet weight that's just impossible to replicate replicate i've never found it anywhere else in the world um would you agree it's about a 10-year view before it starts to get that it just changes gets that sort of honeysuckle uh this wondrous wondrous texture yeah look, i think there's yeah it definitely needs i mean these days seven or eight as a minimum yeah you want to have that you want to still retain some of that fresh citrus but you want to have that complexity come through yeah. and that richness come through from model age i mean that's what it's all about hunter yeah. valley's well, it's it's probably australia's only unique wine style i mean most of the other varieties and most of the other wines are pinot's a copy from burgundy cabernet's yeah. a copy from bordeaux whereas hunter valley semion is truly unique no one else yeah. does it like we do it um the bordeaux semions are aged in barrel i mean yeah. It is truly unique and truly a, a wonderful place. Um, Guys, I think it's important to point out as well, certainly as the semi on ages, and further to your point, Rob, but you, you pick up almost some of these lanolin sort of waxy characters yeah. and, and the brain starts to tell you, oh, this great integration of oak, but there's not. You know, this is just one of the uniqueness of this semi on. There's, there's no oak whatsoever. It's just, like you said, Rob and Adrian, those aging abilities and, and how it changes. You know, we... We joke that it's, you know, that, but it's true, but it's the, the hunter's gift to the wine world. Yep. You know, like you said, Adrian, it's just this really unique wine that just changes perceptions and, um, and paradigms. I remember, yeah, and, and, sorry, sorry go wrong. no, I just oh, remember okay. Max Lake once saying to, I, I happened to be sitting at a, a, a tasting with him in Sydney and he'd had way too much Barolo like myself and he started banging on about these bloody pretentious uh, uh wine critics that were all sitting in this in this tasting it was one of the highlights of my time in australia was that that friday afternoon with max but one of the things that he said uh was there's no question that hunter semion is the thing that defines australian wine uh and he was quite and, and that's from a man you make chardonnay in the hunter we used to make chardonnay in the hunter he wasn't a semion man but uh he was so specific about just how unique the wine is from that region uh, and it was something I'll always remember. Yeah, it's very, it's a very, very special place, and especially right, and the, and the locals talk about it like it's the greatest thing, and um, you know, and very dictated by climate. I'm sure when they put the semi on in 50, oh, 80 years ago, that they were expecting to pick it at 13 Beaumont and make a rich, full, riper style. But you know, the weather dictated the style. We had to, uh, yeah. we have these rains come through in March, and we have to get it off before then, and it's almost. The, the climate has dictated how we make our wines and, and for the greater good. Yep, quite right. Maybe at this point we should move on to um, the Shiraz Pinot. I, I remember once reading, Adrian, uh, years ago that there, uh, there was an accusation that in Burgundy, a lot of Hermitage was, was blended back into, Bur into Burgundies in the, in the 40s and 50s. Um, there was an accusation about it. I don't think it's ever been proven. But, but at, at first bite, the idea of Blending Pinot with Shiraz is, is, it seems, a really left field notion. Uh, you know, we all, we all drink loads of Shiraz Cab, but Shiraz Pinot is a very specific style. What was the motivation for that? Um, oh, maybe O'Shea told them to do it. Yeah. He was over there. <laughs> well, he, he went, he came back and bought the place in 21. He, to think he went to France as a 15 year old on a boat to go to university in France. It's pretty amazing That's incredible. for someone that young yeah. to, to sit on a boat for, I mean, I don't know what the voyage would have been, you know, a month, a bit yeah. over a month yeah. to go over the loneliest thing. But in the Hunter Valley, Pinot grows very differently to the rest of Australia. It's very rugged um, and very rich, similar to sort of Pomard, Santonay down the south of um, Burgundy, because yeah. it has a lot more tannin, a lot more structure and, Shiraz in the Hunter Valley is a lot lighter and more vibrant. So by adding this Pinot across it, it Pinot, not many people know this, but Pinot is probably, you know, I think it's the third or fourth most tannic variety in the world, but it's how you make it. It's the finesse of the tannins, which make it seem so slippery and smooth. Oh, and that's, that's so interesting. I'd never, I'd never take note of that because yes, yeah, you're right. Everything's don't, about don't, finesse and elegance and structure and... Yeah. You know, Don't quote me on the fourth most tannic variety, but it's right, it's right up there. Um, yeah. But it's how you make Pinot and it's finessing and gentle extraction of those tannins, um, mm. which makes it silky and people don't ever comment on the tannins. Um, but in the Hunter, yeah, those peanut, those tannins are quite rugged. And so by blending it across the Shiraz, yeah. it gave the wine structure and it gave the wine tannin. Um, and with tannin comes age. Um, and he was the first person to make the blend Pinot across Shiraz. Yeah. Um, back in the time and uh, we're, we're thankful 
for it because he started his first um, Mount Henry um, named after one of his good friends, Henri Renault, who was his salesman in Sydney, um, as, he, as he named most of his wines after his mates. Yeah. Um, he put it together and, and Phil Ryan, I think, brought that wine back in 97, um, just as an experimental muck around blend. And we've done it in 98, 2002, 2011, and it's been a staple in, in the um, Mount Pleasant architecture since 2014. And, and from that, we now, we're now seeing examples of Shiraz Pinot all across Australia. First sparked up in the Hunter Valley. Now it's in the Yarra Valley. Now there's people in Adelaide Hills doing it. Um, I've got a good mate in New Zealand who makes one. Um, it's really becoming a thing and, you know, and a very left field of, of what you would expect. Um, very so with, to the great positive blend. With this Mount Henry, it's Shiraz dominant, right? So what, what is the actual split between the two varieties? I was hoping you could taste it and tell me. <laughs> well, we'll have to call on on uh, Ghirardello to give us an idea, because I don't I don't have the wines in front of me. Luigi, no. what do you? No. Have a guess. Have a guess. I've got to say this is the first time I've I've had this vintage of it, and I'm really quite surprised. I'm always very really skeptical about the blend, but yeah, hey, it's really cool actually. Um, I would um. I'd actually be going more along the 50-50 line. I see characteristics of both great varieties coming through. So how far wrong am I? Fairly. Um, but you're not wrong in terms of we don't want any of those varieties to, to shine through. We want, we want them in balance. So hmm. they range. It, we've had um, ratios as low as 50-50. We've had ratios at 80-20. Um, it's all about getting those two varieties into balance. And one season might have a really great Pinot year. And so you, you can use a bit more of that. It's all about getting those two varieties into balance. Um, so I think the 18 was 70-30, sure has been. It's, it's, it's a lovely balance. Yeah, and they, and they made, very, yeah, made separately, um, deliberately, um, held in barrel, treated the same. Um, and then the best barrels are pulled out the Pinots from those 100-year-old vines. Um, so using a bit more density and structure and the Shiraz comes off Rose Hill, um, which is lighter, more floral, more fragrant, um, and a bit lighter in tannin. So you're adding tannin back to something that um, has a bit less of it. Um, and That's the thing. I, I would have expected the Shiraz, especially at 70% blend, to dominate. And it doesn't. They actually do. You, you still get the very distinct um, trace elements of Pinot. You, you, they... they they're very evident, especially in the back palate. Uh, the nose is more dominated by the Shiraz, definitely, but the back palate, you're getting those silky tannins coming through, and it's less of a Shiraz on the back palate than it is at the front. Yep, and we try it. I mean, we try multiple blends all, all across the board, all different ranges, and it's really about drinkability um, and what suits yeah. um, in terms of complexity and balance. Uh, it's interesting yeah. because uh, last week we were talking to a, a producer in uh, in Tuscany and uh, he has the antithesis viewpoint. He has this, admittedly, a much smaller operation, but he has one and a half hectares of Cabernet and Merlot and every year it's 50-50 as dictated by the church. It's never going to change. We, we're doing it that way. So his argument is that in, in, in using a, a, a strict formulation of blend, it's more of an interpretation of vintage um, as opposed to the approach that you take in terms of examining the product of vintage and getting the very best from it. It's, it's a really, really interesting thing to contrast as, as uh, philosophies in, in blending. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, for me, it's about staying true to what we believe in and making the yeah. best wine. Yeah. Um, if, we, if we made it a 50-50 every year, some years that Pinot would scream out and it, it would almost, it wouldn't be, um, offensive, but it would be dominant Pinot, very structural. The probably balance wouldn't be sad. right. Yeah, you know, I get yeah, it. the balance would be right. But yeah. we're all all, we're all about drinkability, uh, making sure we're making the best wine possible, and, yeah. and that's how we do it. I'm also fascinated by the notion of Pinot being the dominant theme in the blend. It, you know, the, the the varietal that maybe sets the stage for the wine, and the Shiraz then coming in around it. My because my Initial, when I, when I think of a Shiraz Pinot blend, I'm thinking of the Shiraz being the, the wine that actually sort of sets the, sets the pace 
of the of the construct of the white. So it's a really interesting, in fact, fascinating notion. Yeah, we think we're thinking about next year about um, bringing the reversed blend in, so making a Pinot Shiraz as a contrasting wine. Um, oh, okay, that would be so amazing. Just, yeah, 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 just in, just into the portfolio, just you know, hundred dozen here and there, just just for people to have a look at it, because a lot of people say, what would it look like as a Pinot Shiraz? Yeah, yeah, and I sort of say, well, you, it's more of a lay down wine. It would look this we this drinks beautifully now, whereas the Pinot Shiraz could you know give it 20, 23, 24 before yeah, it starts yeah. merging and you know looking really great. Those tannins need to soften. Dave's asking uh, about a twenty plus year view on this wine. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of scared even of the very best of, of Burgundy on a 20 plus viewpoint. It'd be interesting to see what, what your viewpoint is. Um, look, I'm, yeah, look, I'm always skeptical of, you know, trying to predict the future and how wines have aged. I've been fortunate enough to show a lot of my wines to Phil Ryan, who was the chief oh, yeah. winemaker here from 78 to 2012. And he assures me that these wines will age beautifully and perhaps better than what I mean, we've got a lot better technology now than they ever had. Um, so we're, we've got a lot more our, you know, disposal in terms of bottling. Um, a, a lot more research has gone into making our wines better, cleaner, yeah. um, better ability to age. So he assures, and you know, 25 years ago, I wasn't smart enough or interested in wine or something to be able to, to look at young wines and, and then know what they look like. Yeah. these days and sort yeah. of you got to learn on the fly and um and that was always my question how do you think this wine's going to look in 25 years time and he's assuring me that they're going to look fantastic and you know they, they potentially look better than a lot of the wines he's made which is reassuring but still yeah that's very cool all right if, if you, if you store them sorry if you store no. them above your fr fridge or in your boot of your car they probably won't last that long but... <laughs> yeah there was a story that somebody once told me about a farmer who showed up at one of the grange clinics and he'd been uh, religiously purchasing grange for decades and decades and decades. And uh, apparently the question was asked, uh, how had he stored it? He said, oh, I'll put it under a tarp in the, in, in, the sharing, in the sharing shed. And needless to say, his wonderful collection of grange was completely toast because it got the winter and it got the summer and it got the sheep and it was definitely not the ideal environment. Stay dry though. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Adrian, let's look at the last two now, side by side, a little bit unfair, but uh, very different styles, uh, you know, vintages. We're looking at yep. the old paddock and old hill. So I'm assuming two vineyards side by side, uh, sorry, uh, equally drawn uh, fruit from, from both, both sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we look, do we look at, have we looked at the Rose Hill 06? Yeah, go to no, the Rose Hill Sorry, I'm jumping. Yeah, I'm jumping, sorry. Rose Hill That's Shiraz right, 06. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just going off Garrick's fine spreadsheet. Oh yeah, no, that, that's great. No, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great Powerful. opportunity to have a have a have a look at the Rose Hill and the old paddock yes. and old hill side by side. Yes, definitely. And you can see the differences. You know, yes, there's some vintage difference, but Adrian, what is it? It's five kilometers as the crow flies the vineyards, but uh, they're, they're vastly different wines. Yeah, very, very, very different in terms. Of if you if you're lucky enough to have both of them in front of you and to be able to taste them um, against each other. Um, you know, Rose Hill, northeasterly facing aspect, gets all the morning sun, dries out, and is one of the latest ripeners in the Hunter Valley, so much so that, you know, we try and egg things on um, to get it into the winery because we all start panicking when everyone else has picked all their fruit and it's still hanging on the vine. But you now with that time on the vine becomes flavour accumulation, um, concentration um, and power. Um, so we're very fortunate to have our site. And conversely, um, the estate, the old paddock and old hill, sits against the Broken Back Ranges um, and is one of the first vineyards picked in the Hunter Valley and almost the first red in the Hunter Valley. Um, but it's very fortunate because it, it sits against the highest peak of, of the range. And so the afternoon, well, when it's 38 degrees in the Hunter Valley and 20% humidity and, and cooking, the sun's setting down behind that hill at four o'clock in the afternoon where every, every other vineyard in the valley is baking until eight o'clock at night. So it's a very, very unique site, and they, they were very smart when they planted all the old vines in the valley because they do run around that ridge, and they're all very protected um, from that afternoon sun. And very, very different. Again, it, it retains all its tannin, um, a lot darker fruit spectrum, um, 
as opposed to rose hill, which is more floral, violets, and red currants. Um, and then what we've done is taken cuttings from this old hill and replanted a, a number of vineyards on, on the property um, from that same genetic material um, to keep a lot of consistency. And so we're very fortunate now that we can taste wines using the same genetic material that were planted in 1880, 2014, 1921, 2019, all these different blocks now. Um, and what it's really showing is vine age um, rather than different clonal issues and changes. Um, 2006, 2009, both great years in the Hunter Valley, both warm years um, and in the Hunter, that's a blessing. Um, and I'd say very similar. They should, you know, almost look very similar in age because um, 06 is probably going to age the greater of the wines, um, in my opinion, being slightly cooler. Um, but the, hopefully they do show their the unique differences um, across those vineyards. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to... Um, so, to mate, you're out. saying that six as a vintage was probably something that has more longevity, so cooler? Was it cooler in terms of, in terms of harvest time and that, the ripening period? Yeah, it was a little bit cooler. So the vines, uh, the grapes sat on the vines for right. a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the longer your grapes can hang on the vine, the cooler it is, the more flavour accumulation, the more concentration, um, the more tannin retention, um, which, and the better acid retention, we're all compounding to greater wines with better ability to age. Yeah. Um, 09 was a little bit warmer. Um, so you'll have riper fruit spectrums, um, a little bit warmer, probably slightly higher in alcohol. Um, probably a bit more forward yeah. at this youngest at this early stage. Yeah, yeah, I would think. I mean, I've got the 09 there, and I mean, to me, it's a great drink and, and very typical of its time. Um, let's not forget it's 12 years old as well. Yep. Um, so, and it's still showing a little bit of fresh fruit there, which is a great thing. Um, again, screw caps do a great job um, preserving Australian wines. Um, I Adrian, yeah, mate. I'm sitting here with my, my lovely wife, she who must be obeyed. Absolutely. Now, we spent all of our lives uh, being you know, from Sydney, you know, going up to the Hunter when we were starving law students before we became starving lawyers, but um, <laughs> driving, driving up to the Hunter, getting a snoutful, and then obviously staggering home. The one thing that always used to be a hallmark of Hunter Shiraz in particular was that earthy leather saddle stuff. I'm not seeing that here at all. So I'm wondering, are you sure you just haven't brought in fruit from Eden Valley? Or is it is it that the, the region has actually changed the way it makes wine or whatever? Because for, for decades, it was always that same characteristic, that stamp of earthiness leather saddle and either you liked it or you hated it and we sort of found that over time it became a bit boring but yeah, these dear, wines are great a dear friend used to define it as john wayne's crotch which you know if anyone relates to that or, or not yeah. <laughs> yeah well my wife might but I, it, it's, it's, it's not my flavor but, no. but um the but I would anyway, argue it's yeah. probably cleaner winemaking and, and improved yes, winemaking yeah, processes. Yeah. Well, first to the John Wayne's crutch comment, you're yeah. only allowed to use it. You're only allowed to use a, use a descriptor if you've smelt or tasted it before. So, and that's why I have to reference it as a third party. Sadly, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit disturbing. Um, the, the, and Stuart McWilliam, when he was with the company, he did. We did a interview with him probably about ten years ago. And he said to me that all the horsey characters um, left the wine once they changed from horses to tractors in the vineyards. So, <laughs> and, and it's serious. Um, look, I, I would say cleaner winemaking. Um, the AWRI, the Australian Wine Research Institute, does a number of tests on our wines every year. We sit across, um, and our wines are the cleanest in Australia. They've gone from when you were probably up here drinking wines for some of the dirtiest. Um, to now the cleanest wines in Australia. And that is a drive from the Hunter Valley to A, fix their game, and B, knowing what they have at their disposal and making sure they respect that and investing, you know, money, time, effort, everything they can to produce the greatest wines they possibly can. 
That's um, good to know because unfortunately it also reflects the fact that in those days they were great dirty weekends, whereas now. <laughs> no. I don't want to comment on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going in search of John Wayne's crotch. I'm, 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 <laughs> yeah, look, right. much much cleaner wines nowadays, and um, you know, for the for the better, I think. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, time's moving against us, so let's uh, let's go on to the the O'Shea O4, four uh, the fourteen, if we can. Uh, yeah. So the I think Garrick's fallen asleep behind the behind the cursor button. Oi, Garrick. No, are you, mate. Are you there? Oh, good. It's, co it's coming. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Have you got Have you your Telstra? <laughs> Uh, he's got dial-up internet still, North yeah, Sydney. Yeah, yeah, he's furiously bad. You're breaking up. Cycling <laughs> outside. All right, so here we are. There yeah, you go. so Can... we'll move to the O'Shea, but we're just on the, the vineyards. I had more slides, Rob, but you made me cut them out. So yeah, sorry, we're, uh, we're on the vineyard yeah. slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty boring, to be honest. Uh, so the old, old more, paddock vineyard. Just more pictures of Adrian. Yeah. Can you bring that back? Uh, so old paddock. <laughs> Old Paddock Vineyard, that's what Garrick's got up, so that's what I'll talk yeah. about. Um, so the first vineyard that O'Shea planted, um, so he arrived at Mount Pleasant in 1921 uh, with a vineyard that was 41 years old already. Go around to another wine region in Australia and say, I've got 41-year-old vines, and you're like an ancestor. You've got the oldest vines in the, in the region. Um, and that was in 1921, so now 141 years old. Um, they've seen World Wars. I think 1880 was when they invented the light bulb. Uh, so, you know, they've, they've been around. Garrick says more than 90 years. It's now 100. Probably update that slide. Um, but off, cuttings off the old hill. Um, so similar genetic material, um, similar grape structures, um, but a, a very powerful, almost, I'll say the old hill's almost the perfect site. I think the old paddock is the perfect site. Beautifully sheltered from all the westerly sun, all the westerly winds, gets all the morning sun, dries out, the right orientation, you know, everything about that spot, the right soils um, lends itself to, and I, I just wish he planted more of it. It's 0.6 of a hectare. It's bugger all. Um, we get two, two and a half tonnes of fruit out of it. Um, but to me, that's, um, I, I moved to the Hunter Valley to make wines from Rose Hill. I fell in love with that vineyard and wanted to come to Hunter Valley and got the opportunity. And this is now my favourite vineyard or my favourite block. Mate, with, with this prodigious age on these vines, have, did they escape the scourge of phylloxera? Well, they're all on own roots. Um, okay. Actually, the Pinot's on American rootstock, funnily enough, but the um, the old paddock's on its own roots. And it's it's a weird one because phylloxera has been around. It's been up to Scone, which is about an hour north of it. It's been to Hawkesbury, which is about an hour west of us, southwest of us. I, I reckon... It thrives on cooler climates, and I just reckon there's something about the hunter where it doesn't oh, like it. Yeah, it just oh. me every other region it's got into, and it hasn't got into the hunter. And yeah. there's got to be a reason, and I it, it's got to be climatic yeah. because there has been huge companies up here um, that were still around in the Yarra Valley, and the Yarra Valley got burnt by it. Um, and those tractors were coming up here, those trucks and delivery trucks and all that were coming up here as well. It, there has to be a reason why it hasn't come here because it, it, it makes no sense. Yeah. It's been all around, it's been all around, but it just, for some reason, it just won't come in. Fantastic. And, oh, thank, yeah, thank, yeah. thank heavens. Yeah. Um, but I think it's climatic. It's got to be something, it's too warm, too humid, too whatever. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of a phylloxera life cycle, yeah. um, but there's, some, there's something there about it. And, you know, thank heavens, yeah. It hasn't come because we would lose some absolute treasures of the Australian wine industry if it came. That's fascinating, Adrian. Surely, surely there must be a whole bunch of people who are doing uh, doctorates on that. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good question. I don't. I, you know, phylloxera is just one of the things that you sort of learn to accept. I think everyone just goes, well, it's going to get phylloxera. Um, but that's a good point. Um, and I and I don't know if anyone has, but it, 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 it amazes me why it hasn't been here. Maybe someone hasn't done, has done the research, I don't know. Um, it's interesting because it sure as hell has been in, in Spain and that's one of the hottest 
uh, areas for, uh, for, for vines in the world. Um, so it's, it, 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 it's, it's curious. It's, it's very curious. Yeah, but also, Rob, look, look at what Brown Brothers is going through now at Miller Look at what the Kiwis are going through in central Otago. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, you know, you're taking different climates. You know, why is it that suddenly Hunter, yeah. for whatever reason, yeah. is, is exempt? Weird. Yeah, I can't explain it. And hopefully someone will one day. And maybe we've just been lucky. Maybe people, you know, the Hunter's only 1% of the Australian wine industry, if that. So it's a very, very small area. And we bat very, very well above our average in terms of quality produced and the noise that we make on the international stage. Um, you know, Hunter Valley Semyon, Hunter Valley Shiraz. I mean, they are big players in the Australian wine scene. Um, and for the small that we produce... We, very, we rallied together really well as a community, as an industry, the Hunter Valley, um, like no other that I've seen. I haven't seen um, such unison from any other wine region in Australia, and that's a great thing. Uh, that we're, we all support each other. We go to dinners. We're happy to talk about how great other companies' wines are. Um, <laughs> obviously, ours are better, but, you know, no, I don't tell them that. Uh, but, you know, yeah. Adrian, out, out of curiosity, um, only because I, I genuinely don't know, has anyone in the hunter tried Cabernet or tried? They must have, someone must have tried. Lake Folly. Yeah, yeah Lake Folly have made a history of Cabernet and Chardonnay. do a Shiraz Cab. I don't think many other people do it. It's just too late a ripener. I mean, Lake Folly right. have, have got it planted on this south facing, um, southwest facing block that just gets all the sun all day. They crop, they produce the crop down. So it's just constant sunlight, constant ripening, they're opening the canopies up to get ripening through. Everything about it is hard manual labour um, to, get it, to get it right. I mean, any other, they've got, almost got the perfect site for Cabernet. Um, and, you know, they did, Max Lake did say that, you know, Rose Hill and Lakes Folly share the same hill. Mount Pleasant faces north, Lakes Folly faces south. And uh, Max Lake famously said that he bought the other side of the, the hill because Morris O'Shea planted the other side and bought the other side, so he must have what he's doing. That's fantastic. Cool. <laughs> Imagine having dinner with those two. I could think of nothing yeah, oh, better. <laughs> oh, some good chat. <laughs> really cool. All right. Um, Shall we, we up to, on? Garrick? No, yeah, I guess we're, we're just finishing up on, on the O'Shea. I think, um, you know, oh, yeah, if so everyone's yeah. got it in the glass there, maybe just talk about that. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the ageing potential there, I, I just remember Halliday's um, quote for, for that year, he, he gave it 99 points and he said, as close to a 100-year drinking window as you're ever going to see. Good so, word. you know, I this is a wine that we're trying as, as a baby. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So my nan's 102. She's got a bottle tucked away for another 100 years. So she's <laughs> pretty optimistic. Um, That's great. Look, it's, it's one of those great wines. Um blended from all, all those four key sites that we have, the 1880 vines and the 1921 vines on the estate and the, and the block O'Shea planted at Rose Hill, the 1946 vines, um, and blending those into balance. Um, I spoke about the Mount Henry before about getting things in balance and it's making sure that, you know, no block stands out, no vineyard stands out. Um, I think this was the first year that Rose Hill was the dominant um, block in, right. in O'Shea, yeah. So Phil Ryan, when he made the O'Shea's, he was 100% old hill. It was just best, the best of the best old hill that was O'Shea. And it wasn't until 2011 um, when someone, I think maybe Scotty Mack or someone convinced him to use a bit of Rose Hill was the first time that it was yeah. not a not 100% old hill. And then in 2013, it was something like 40% Rose Hill. And in 2014, it was 65% Rose Hill. Um, so the first time in a long time that it had ever been or more Rose Hill. And we always play around with the ratios, always trying to get the best of the best, you know, selecting the best barrels and then, you know, a little half barrel of this, a little quarter barrel of this, you know, 1% of this, 2% of this. What does this do? What does that do? You know, every possible combination, every possible permutation of blends and everything, you know, to make the best one we possibly can. And that's what it's all about. Mm. Um, and the 14, you know, it was my first year um, and Jim Chatto's second, I think. Um, and we're gifted with one of the greatest vintages of all time in the Hunter Valley. And, um, and, and I sort of still maintain that if, if we knew now what we knew then, we would have, we would have been able to make a better wine. Just yeah, we're both crazy. 
Yeah, we're both new to the Hunter Valley. You know, both sort of, oh, I mean, not new to the Hunter Valley, but both new to Mount Pleasant and just winging in a little, not winging in, we, we knew how to make wine, but, you know, understanding vineyards doesn't, that doesn't happen in a year. You need five so or six my, years. My, of, my question would be, what would have changed? Just timing or an understanding of ripening off, off, the, off those vines? Yeah, I think winemaking. Uh, I think pick, picking windows we probably got right. I think uh-huh. winemaking wise, I've, I've changed, definitely changed up winemaking um, in terms of fermentation management, more plunging, less pumping over. I backed off oak using less Silver Cooper and more of other. And now to explain oak, what they do, Burgundy Coopers are usually more smoky and a bit more yeah. toasty and high impact, whereas Bordeaux Coopers are usually about more structure and less nose mm-hmm. and so I, i've sort of gone towards more board oak covers because i don't want oak impact on the nose i want oak mm. to play a part in structure um, and to fill pallets out and i think if we had those covers back in 14 we might have made some slightly better wines yeah um, I, I, but you know I, I, does that does that change as well with the size of barrels are you are you using you know bigger barrels now and you, know, you talked about the seasoning but are you changing the size of barrels and the age of barrels yeah, I'm using all 500s now. When I first got here, they were all 300s. Um, yeah. So that's litres. That's more about surface area to volume, less surface area to volume, less oak impact. Um, yeah, now we've got we've got some Pudras now, which are 2,800 litre barrels, uh, which we seasoned in a couple of years with some Philip and stuff, and then you know throw some really top end wine. Um, we've got an uh, an old paddock wine in there this year from the old paddock vineyard, which goes into old paddock and old hill. Um, you know, three year old your old food right now which looks banging um so it's really positive that we've you know you've got to invest it and, and give those food a couple of years and then they really start singing so it's pretty exciting now okay and, and a drinking window i mean i i remember the first time i tried O'Shea, and i probably shouldn't say it on this call but i was like well what, what's all this about and i and i deliberately left them in the glass because it wasn't really you know blowing my mind straight out of the bottle but three hours later in the glass, this wine just transformed and it just becomes this layered complexity just jumping out of the glass. I guess my question is, you know, at what age do you like to drink these O'Shea's? Is, is the 2014 vintage being a really strong vintage with seven years of age, you know, a perfect window to start trying O'Shea? Yeah. Yeah, look, I think, I think it... Hunter Reds go through this thing where they look beautiful for a while and they start going into these secondary characters, and that's the period, that's your drinking window um, for me with Hunter Reds. Um, and the greatest wines is that secondary period will be, you know, for poorer wines, it'll be three years. For O'Shea's, it'll be 50 to 70 years. And then they'll turn to that tertiary, they'll fall over. Right. Um, and to, to me, getting to that secondary sort of phase, uh, to me, that that turned probably two years ago into that perfect drinking area. And that's how long it can maintain that. And until they talks, talks of a hundred year old wine, it's how long it can maintain that freshness with those secondary complexity characters. Uh, it's interesting that'll, that'll, you say that because uh, a couple of months ago, I hauled out my prayer rug and opened a bottle of O2 graveyard. And um, I wasn't feeling the love at all. And I, I, I was just blown over by like what was happening. And it, that's exactly to your point now. It just it does go through these cycles because the yep. cork was in good neck. It was well, you know, I got it straight from the winery. It was you know, definitely had it had the right kind of uh, provenance, but there was just no love at all. It just wasn't giving yep. anything. Yeah, so it might be past its window. Yeah, yeah. I think I think, and Rob, you said it right at the very start of the, of the night about decanting you decant your semi on and your chardonnay like, yeah. i i think if, if you really want to respect your wines unless you're smashing a new zealand savvy blanc or something <laughs> hopefully no one is yeah please no uh, <laughs> yeah i mean just get off the call uh, <laughs> um I, I i decant most of my wines at home just yeah. pour them into the canter air is air is the enemy when you're making wines and it is your friend when you're drinking them when you drink it yeah. Kelvin's yeah. asking about the, that O'Shea. Um, it, ciao. Uh, 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 Kelvin, are you asking about the, uh, which vintage O'Shea are you asking about? 
I'm not sure if he's listening. Can I ask what he thinks the winner would be for the O'Shea? We got some when we were there in 2019. I don't know what vintage is. I don't know what vintage It, it would have been 14. 14. Yeah, four, maybe 17 might have been released. No. The one that 14 left in Sydney, yeah. I mean, yeah, if it's in Sydney, just leave it there. It'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're trying, you're trying it now. You don't need to open it now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Feel free to buy some more. Drink yeah. and go and buy some from Rob. <laughs> yeah, actually, I take that back. Drink up. Yeah. Um, look, I think your drinking window is fine on that O'Shea. I mean, that looks pretty. I'm having a glass now. Um, they'll probably look at it twice a year, um, once every six months to see how it's going. And to me, it hasn't really changed in the last two or three years. It's sort of in that in that zone now. Um, and the, the, one of the great things you can do is, and while well, this might sound not appealing to some, you drink a whole bottle yourself, but you don't need to smash it in 25 minutes. Drink, set yourself up in front of the TV at six o'clock at night or, and drink it over four hours and watch how, and I was talking about air being your friend, watch how, watch how it changes. Watch, decant it before that first glass and take your time. You don't need to be, you know, rolling around. Yeah. Sit there and just take your time. And if you've got someone there with you, share it, just drink slowly in small glasses and, and watch it change. And, and because it's an, it's an amazing thing if you've got the patience to do that. It was yeah, some of the greatest I, I think experiences. I'd, I'd need a quality controller to make sure that it takes four hours, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost certain I'd smash time, it yeah, in right? under four. That's yeah. why you've got the little bottles, Rob. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just, it's a really, one of the greatest experiences of my life was sitting there drinking a bottle by myself. I was around and playing drill with someone, they weren't drinking. And I drank this wine over three or four hours because I had to drive home and, you know, just watching it unfurl and unfold and the changes that a wine can give you because it could go from being, oh, I don't know, to an hour later going, oh my God, this yeah. is unreal. And then, and then instantly to me that says, well, next time I have this wine, I'm just going to tip it into the decanter and leave it for that X time. That's and often to... when I've sat at dinners um, where people bring really old stuff, all, I, I think over the years, all too soon, I've um, jumped to judge that the wine's oxidized or past its prime and what have you. And uh, these, these days I tend to save the glass and, and come back to it two or three hours later. And clearly subjectivity has gone out the window at that stage, but there's no question that the vast majority of those wines, even when they're pretty putrid after the initial decanting and pouring, a lot of them find religion over time. Yep. Somehow they seem to just pull themselves together uh, yeah. and, and really find the path. So it's great. Yeah, massive name dropping story here, but I had James Holiday up at the winery yeah. and we and we cracked a 53 Lovedale. Yo! Um, <laughs> and, it, and, and we poured around. So I remember... Um, Carol Summers from Hey and Saturday. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, there, so there, mate. So he was there. And um, and we poured this 53 Love Down. It looked terrible. I was like, oh, that was a waste of time. And then we started talking about other things and tasting other wines. And we went back to about 20 minutes later and it was unreal. That's amazing. It was like, oh, my God. Yeah. So it's gone from oxidised shit, I don't want to yeah. drink that, to holy hell. And I reckon 15 minutes later, it was cactus again. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that... Drinking window was about 15 minutes of just perfection. And it's about exactly to your point, Rob. You, you just you give the wines time, give them their chance. Give yeah. them, if you don't like it, just put it to the side, come back to it now, later. You know, you know, it might surprise you. Lou and Di and I did a tasting years ago. I mean, geez, like maybe 10 or 12 years ago of a 53 Latour with some people. And I was so nervous because it was like, it was our first sort of right in the beginning of the business and there was 12 people there and everyone brought sort of equal value or quality wines and the, the wine was I remember opening it initially and thinking okay the fruit's still there and then I didn't decant it because I thought it was too fragile so I poured it for everybody and it was okay and then went off a cliff and I thought oh geez that's it and it came back but to your point it came back for a very short period of time minutes yep. Literally, yeah, I, reckon, I reckon those really old wines have only got a 20 and 25 minute drinking window, and then yeah. the curio wines that you need to have a few people there with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, thanks for. I'm sorry for running over time. It's been fantastic to talk to you two guys back in back home in Oz. Thank you so much for sponsoring tonight. 
uh, and no, letting you can't us cut me out of my question. You oh, can't sorry, do you, this. Sorry, sorry. You so rude. You really are. <laughs> uh, Adrian, the question we always ask our guest winemakers is when no one's looking and the lights are off, what do you drink and enjoy drinking? Uh, oh, I made Chardonnay my whole life. Um, so I love Chardonnay. Um, these days, Pinot, Shiraz and Riesling. Uh, I, I am very, Australia has a great wealth of great Rieslings and they're ridiculously cheap because no one drinks Riesling in Australia. I don't know why, they're beautiful drinks. Um, so that's probably my white wine. And then I would go, oh, Hunter Shiraz. Um, I like to try everyone's Shiraz to see what they like in the Hunter Valley. And then I like to try Pinots from all over the world, different styles. So medium bodied reds, aromatic Riesling. Well, you cordially advise- Come on, give us a brand, give us a brand. What do you drink? <laughs> what do you reach for? Come on, compromise your soul. Uh, there has to be another brand. Yeah, give us 